Battery manufacturers all over the world are trying to get better and more fantastic stuff, and who knows, maybe they'll even get it, but better can have a bunch of different meanings. It could be higher performance, it could be more affordability, it could be who knows what. I don't, which is why I brought on Jordan Gisagate from The Limiting Factor to help us figure out what in the heck is going on. I'm Brian. Welcome to Future Raza. <laughs> So Jordan is back joining us again. Uh, I love his work. I subscribe to him on uh, Patreon. I think only Patreon. I might also have you somewhere else, but I don't recall because he gives you early access to his stuff. And that's, I can't get enough. So I have to do that. Uh, same reason I subscribe to uh, Joe Techmeyer is uh, to get all his bonus material and James Stevenson to get my whole week of content on a Saturday. It's wonderful. Uh, so. With that said, uh, I uh, would like to remind everyone that you can support Jordan on Patreon, on X, on YouTube as a channel member, and that's how he's able to bring us the brilliance. And a quick thanks to Jim for signing up on Patreon on my side. Thank you guys so much. It's how we get this stuff done. So last time we talked about things that are real and here and today, but let's talk about the future. Uh, how many chemistries do you think could reach production in the next five to 10 years. New, new chemistry, things we don't have oh, on the wow. market today. Okay. Well, it depends on how broadly you define chemistry. Sure. Doping, I think, counts. Hmm. Because generally they can consider like NMC 111, 622, 811. Those are all considered different chemistries. So it's really, there's such a, a broad variety. From my perspective, the main two that are going to have a big impact on the market in the next five to six years are going to be LMFP and sodium ion batteries. Mm -hmm. So yeah. lick my friggin', what is that one? <laughs> I can't say it. So. <laughs> <laughs> LMFP is uh, lithium, manganese, iron, phosphorus. Yeah, I should have clarified. Sorry. Yeah. I'm throwing out, I'm throwing okay. out. Acronym, but it's just uh, making sure uh, lithium, manganese, iron phosphate, the F being ferro for iron. Yes. And then, of course, sodium ion is straightforward. <laughs> mm. And yes, okay. We have some fun, you guys. Uh, so sodium batteries are looking like they are, as you said, going to be commercialized. We've seen some trials in China. Um, if the energy density is not adequate for automotive use, is it likely that we could see those in a stationary use, which would then free up LFPs to move up the chain? Bingo. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. It's battery Tetris. You get some batteries, you can shift the uh, the LFP supply to something else. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, using sodium ion will uh, expand the total pie, which is what okay. we want. Yeah. Yeah. So perfect. That's, it's like adding another side dish. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, you, uh, when you're building something, the more materials and different options that you have to design something, the better. So it's it's not that sodium ion is going to displace everything. Uh, a lot of people assume that when a new battery comes on the market or new battery chemistry, that it's just going to, all right, it's going to destroy everything else and it's game changing. But really, it's more subdued than that. It's a little, it's a, it slowly changes the market over time. And every different chemistry has different strengths and weaknesses, and it finds its spot in the market. So I, I had a chance to talk with a benchmarking firm in Detroit last year at the battery show. By the way, if you get a chance, you absolutely need to go to it. It's wonderful. Uh, could not get anyone on camera all day because that's not what they're there for. They're business to business, but they will answer all your questions. And one I asked was, it was a company that had torn down the leaf, the tie can, the lucid, the, the, not the plaid, but the, just the model S. And they had pieces of each of those batteries on display. And I said, who makes the best battery? And the engineer said, that's the wrong question. The best battery for what? I said, okay, let's start the easy way. Who makes the worst battery? It's the Leaf, right? And he said, no. Best battery, for, worst battery for what? Do you want the cheapest one? The easiest to cool? The lowest maintenance? That's the Leaf. It's the best for that. So with, with that said, all kinds of batteries. See, you love me. You know it. All these yeah. different things work in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. So there is no best or worst necessarily. Although uh, a battery that fails is obviously a bad battery. So air batteries, what are they? Does it matter? How do they work? What, what, what's that all about? 
Well, this is something I need to do a deep dive on. But basically, uh, I forget if, if it's the cathode or the anode, but it uses the ambient air as one of the electrodes. So basically, you can eliminate half the battery and uh, dramatically increase your energy density. At least that's my understanding. As I said, it's it's not something I've done a deep dive on. Um, the, the reason why I haven't done a deep dive on them is because they're uh, all the people I've spoke to, it's something that's so far in the future that it's not something really worth worth um, doing a deep dive on yet. Right. Too far mm -hmm. out from commercialization, yeah. apparently. M3P, what's that about? Same question. Should we care? Does it matter? Yeah. So the, the M3P chemistry, my understanding uh, is that's just an LMFP battery, but it has marketing attached to it by, you know, M3P, they wanted it sound to sound cool. It sounds sound like than music to my ears, sort yeah. of. <laughs> yeah, I'm <it's>... dyslexic. <laughs> yeah. And LMFP chemistry, that's all it is from all the research that I've done on it. So it'll just be a, an LFP battery that has some extra dopants that increase the voltage and add some stability. So uh, you can get more range for so low when, cost. When hmm. doping an anode or a cathode, what does that mean? It just means adding a little bit of it, right? That's a good question because uh, it depends if you're talking about the anode or the cathode. If you're talking about the cathode, what they do is they grow these cathode materials like crystals and they, they grow them to lots of little crystals into a particle. Uh, now within that crystal structure, when you're growing the crystal, you add uh, different atomic elements. It gets incorporated into that crystal structure. So with the cathode, it's actually part of the crystal structure, that doping. Uh, and that changes the angles of all the uh, atoms within that crystal. It changes their the way they react and their voltage, et cetera. With the anode, when you say it's doped with silicon, what you're really doing is you're just, you have a bunch of graphite particles, for instance, and then you're adding some silicon powder in with it. So it's actually, it's not incorporated into the crystal structure. It's two separate particles. Okay. Yeah. And would those crystals increase the surface area? Now you're talking about the anode? Yes. Okay. So yeah, that, that does, using smaller particles, that does increase uh, the total surface area. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And, and you have to pick the right particle sizes. Otherwise they crack and explode and, uh, well not explode. They, they crack and they disintegrate. So you have to choose the right particle sizes. So that's, that's a whole material science discussion. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Building a battery that's resilient enough to be in something that moves and vibrates all the time, it's got to be a little bit of work. So uh, I don't know if you've heard the very exciting news from Toyota. They've announced that they've got a solid state battery that's going to be ready for commercialization in two to three years. Now, I know they've said this every 18 months for the last 15 years, but this time they're super serious. Is this a thing? Are they just pulling my chain again? They they have the most battery patents for solid state out of any company. But in terms of actually bringing something to market, it doesn't look like th there's going to be anything major happening with their solid state batteries until the end of the decade. I think there was another press release uh, just a few weeks ago that basically said it, it revealed their production rate. And it was in the megawatt hours, not in the gigawatt hours from memory. You'd have to you'd have to check me on that, but yeah, it doesn't look like they're looking at any serious scale for their solid state batteries, even later this decade. So despite all their hype about, all right, we have a solid state battery coming, I'm sure it is coming, but is it going to come in large enough volume and soon enough to make a difference is the question. Because my thought is if they had that miracle battery that's cheaper to make, that's safer, that charges all the way up in five, 10 minutes. They would not be pursuing hydrogen. They would not be pursuing hybrids. They probably wouldn't even pursue cars. They'd just become the world's largest battery manufacturer and cash in on that. Yeah. And, and this thing's going to be expensive. And that's the main challenge with solid state. I, I did a post uh, criticizing or critiquing Toyota's uh, claims about that solid state battery. And then Drew Baglino from Tesla jumped in and said, yeah, you also have to take into account the fact that these solid state separators, they have a high concentration of lithium in them to create that conductivity and that increases the cost. So if your main goal is mass production, low cost, you want to go with a liquid electrolyte battery. So solid state is definitely going to have a use case where high energy density is needed, high performance products. But most likely what we're going to see is we're going to see liquid electrolyte batteries and we're going to see less of these 
high-end chemistries uh, with high nickel, and we're going to see things like LFP, LMFP moving into the higher range vehicles, and even sodium ion. I see that later this decade, uh, you know, taking over more of the market. And on that note, sodium ion, sodium ion solid state, that's a different story. Because sodium is so cheap and you're going to make that sodium solid state separator out of it, you can use as much as you want and, want, and it won't have a big impact on the price of the battery. So sodium ion or sodium solid state seems very promising to me because you get every benefit with the energy density of like a high nickel battery cell. Oh, that would be interesting. Mm, so I've yeah. seen speculation that the battery production in Texas could ramp to 100 gigawatts, uh, gigawatt hours. 200 gigawatt hours. Those numbers strike me as awfully, awfully high considering the square footage. It's a very small corner of the building. Mind you, it's a huge building, but it's a fraction of the size of Giga Nevada, but would have three times the output, six times the output. Uh, is that a typo or what are they doing different? The assumption with most people is that it's uh, that's going to be uh, the current phase is 100 gigawatt hours and the next phase is going to be 200 gigawatt hours. I think worst case scenario, depending on how re you read what they've said, it's going to be uh, a minimum of 50 gigawatt hours and uh, a maximum of 100 for phase one and phase two. Sorry, phase one could be 50 and phase two could be uh, 100 gigawatt hours. That's on the low end. So what are they doing differently? They've because of their dry process, it allows them to strip out all the lines that they need to dehydrate the material uh, with a wet coating process. With a wet coating process, you apply a slurry, and then you have ovens that are about a football field long that you have to uh, run that material through at high speed uh, to dry all that off. And then when you recapture all the, the solvent that's dried, you need your own factory, your own chemical plant to recapture that, reprocess it so it can be used again. So that, that's the main thing. So the 100 to 200 gigawatt hour number is real and mm -hmm. in your estimation, not an insane thing to say. Definitely not insane at, at all. And there's, that's just the major factor, but there's a lot of other things that they're doing as well. Their coding machines have an output that's about seven times higher than a typical, or mm, between five and six times higher than a, a, a typical wet coding machine. Wow. So that they is... can, needs much fewer machines in a smaller space. So in every area of the line, they've optimized things to make it smaller, more capital efficient, higher throughput. And more better use utilization of cubic space, vertical space, rather than just making everything linear. Yeah, that's one of the things. If you watch the video from Giga Austin, that it's you're looking on down almost two or three stories where they have these uh, this webbing of the cathode and anode material. Or sorry, the uh, the electrode foils. Um, yeah, it, it's like looking through the atrium of a building, and they have the material moving in in three D space. It's real cool. Yeah. Wow, that's mm -hmm. crazy. The only scale that I've been able to recognize in those in that footage is when you see the silo of what I assume is them getting their first batch of power put into all of them. It's a big wall of a machine that uh, looks like a silo. Yeah. yeah, what that is, is uh, it's almost like an archive or a library filled with batteries. You know, there's all these shelves and cubbies and things like that. And that's where they do, uh, they charge the battery cells for the first time and they do formation, which is that's forming the solid electrolyte interface on the anode so the battery can last a long time. Because the first time you cycle a battery cell, there's chemicals in the electrolyte that react with the anode and it creates a passive layer on the anode. That's what they're doing. They're kind of cooking that on there. It has to be the right temperature for the right, right temperature and the right voltage for the right length of time to get the, build that nice layer on there. It's so complicated. It is mm. such a science. And we're seeing that because manufacturers are having a hard time doing it. Fortunately, it looks like they've mostly caught up, at least globally. Now, IRA credits are very generous for manufacturers, I think, of batteries. We've got, what, 35 bucks a, a kilowatt, another 10 if you make the pack. So at the pack level, if you made the batteries and the pack, you're getting 45 bucks a, a a watt or kilowatt? What is it? A kilowatt? Yeah. So kilowatt you could, hour, yeah. For, for a kilowatt hour. So mm -hmm. you could get work. That that sounds awfully close to the price 
that the packs are getting to. <laughs> could we get, could we get in the next few years down to 45 bucks a kilowatt hour at the pack level? With a sodium ion battery at the pack level, by the end of the decade, I think you could get there. I think that's what CATL is targeting is like 40. Tesla, I know Jeff Don's lab is working on sodium ion batteries. And I just spoke with uh, Shirley Munn yesterday, and she's getting very excited about uh, uh, the commercialization and building a sodium ion industry in the United States. Uh, but even if, let's say, worst case scenario, you're looking at like a nickel based battery pack at the end of the decade, 60 to $70 a kilowatt hour to manufacture, and then you get a $45 tax credit. For the most part, you're getting those batteries for free that you're putting into your vehicle. Uh, and if it's an LFP battery cell, 50 or, yeah, I mean, CATL is already, CATL and BYD are already selling their battery cells at about 55 to $60 per kilowatt hour at the cell level. At the pack level, that's probably like 70. So by the end of the decade, they're going to be getting real close, if not below that $45 per kilowatt hour level. It's crazy to think that if the compact uses batteries that are made in North America and the price is already down to, let's say, 60 bucks at the pack level, uh, then, yeah, you're getting your for if it's a 50 kilowatt hour battery, you're paying what, uh, what would that be? Twenty two hundred dollars for your pack. That's hmm. that's that's very encouraging. We shall see how it works out. Uh, you guys, uh, this has been a wonderful treat for me, uh, Jordan. He hasn't felt quite the same way, but we'll get, uh, we'll war he'll warm up next time. You'll see, you'll see. Uh, guys, in the comments, what did we miss? What did we misunderstand? What should I have asked? Because I, this is a list, as you can probably tell, I've been putting together for some time. Uh, and I have fun with this. And I have fun hanging out with you, Jordan. So thank you for that. Yeah, and, uh, it's always enjoyable. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and everybody, uh, head over to uh, the old limiting factor, the and uh, see what that's about. And check, you know, if you haven't watched it, I don't believe you because you're here and you're watching part two of this interview. You're already a fan, but check him out anyway. Uh, everybody else, you know, like, subscribe, do the usual things. Uh, stay tuned, stay juicy, and I cannot wait to hear from you, clever robots, on the flippity flop. <laughs>